is smart. I is smart. You is kind. I is kind. You is important. I is important. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we left off with the Emancipation Proclamation, and the other part that you need to be aware of is the role that African American people played in the actual war. And if you recall, there was a problem for the Union, for Lincoln and the administration, where you had all of these individuals who suddenly now find themselves free coming to the North. They actually called them contraband you know, captured rebel property. And what happens is these individuals, who many of them were at one point in slavery, start demanding that they could fight for the Union Army. In fact, you get people like Frederick Douglass seeing the enlist enlistment of African American men into the Union Army as a way, as an opportunity for citizenship. And the idea is real simple. If you are someone who serves and fights for the United States of America, it becomes increasingly difficult to deny you your rights as a citizen. And so people like Douglas worked very hard to try to get African Americans the opportunity to serve in the Union Army. And you can see, you know, the, the posters, men of color, volunteer, and many, many, many African-American people want to fight. There's a problem, though. It doesn't happen right away. And the big problem is there's a fear amongst Northerners of allowing this to happen. You have tremendous racism. Oh, the black soldiers are not going to be brave enough or smart enough to follow orders or to fight honorably in a war. There's racism also in the, the, the real fear that what happens if you're giving guns to a people who have been oppressed for a very long time? So for a long period, there's a reluctance to allow this to happen. But as time goes on, you have all these people who are willing and able to serve, and the war is changing, the causes or the, 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 what the war is being fought for is changing, you get a transition to... Soldiers. Um, and by the end of the war, about 10% of those soldiers who fought were African American. Now, the wild thing about it is you've got about 10% fighting, which, you know, in terms of population numbers is pretty, pretty impressive. But African-American soldiers were paid less than white soldiers, so there was discrimination there. You were segregated in the military. So if you were an African-American soldier, you served in an all-black regiment. You did not get the opportunity to serve along with others. But many people are going to join. Many African-American men are going to join because... Remember, Dred Scott says, you're not citizens. This was a way for you, as an African-American person, to, to prove your worth to the country and to demand your citizenship and those rights that come with it. So you have about 10% of the Union Army serves. Um, at first, there's a reluctance. But as time goes on, the Union's getting more and more desperate for people. You know, the reality of the war is every little star you see on this map represents a area, or a battle rather, where African-American soldiers fought. So a huge number of battles, some of them really, really important. Different images of African-American soldiers in the Union blue, the uniform of the Union Army. Now here's the thing. In the beginning, most of the jobs that were available for African-Americans in the military were menial jobs digging trenches, carrying supplies, fetching water, things that were, you know, grunt work, you would call it, because there was a discrimination there. But there are numerous examples of African Americans serving in the Civil War uh, 
in, in capacities of great honor. Uh, the most famous battle, here it is in this uh, image, is of the storming of Fort Wagner. Uh, fort Wagner was in South Carolina. African American soldiers had to take this fort, which was heavily defended by the Confederacy. Um, the, the, the unit, the regiment that does fight in the battle knew that most of them would be killed. Uh, so it was basically what we would call a suicide mission. There was very few, uh, there was a very slim chance you were going to make it out of this battle. And one of the most famous regiments, you should know this regiment, the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. Volunteers, fights in this battle, fights bravely in this battle, and eventually, because of their work, their dedication, the fort is eventually taken. Um, if you've seen the movie Glory, that is what the story is based on, the story of the Massachusetts 54th, and you'll notice in the film, as well as in this image, one of the individuals who is being shot at the top of the fort is a white individual, a guy by the name of Robert Gold Shaw, who was the commanding officer. Because even if you were an all-black regiment, you had a white officer. If you never see Glory, Netflix it. Random fun fact. This is real. My uncle, my uncle uh, did not fight in the war. <laughs> Uh, the Joe's people did not come until after this period of time. Uh, my uncle, though, is in the film industry. He's not big time or anything. He does, like, production stuff. But during the movie Glory, which was filmed back in the late 80s, he was a stand-in for Morgan Freeman. Now, what does that mean? That means when they're doing the lighting on the set or they're doing stuff and Morgan Freeman doesn't want to stand there, he would stand there. Uh... He basically did that as his job, uh, along with other things. But the cool thing that happened during the film is at the end of the film, if you've ever seen it, how many of you have seen it? Anybody seen it? A couple of you? A couple? Like eighth grade or something? Yeah. yeah. Back in the day? There's the scene where the soldiers are getting ready to go storm the fort, and they ask, who will hold the flag? Because it's a big deal to be the guy who holds the flag during the battle. You can see, you know, in the image right there. My uncle who is an African-American man, uh, married my aunt, so it's not by blood or anything, but, you know, still the uncle, Uncle Leon. Uh, he volunteered, so in the movie, there's about eight seconds where my uncle is holding the flag and running, wearing a Union uniform, and then after eight seconds, he is shot, <laughs> falls down, and then someone else picks up the flag and runs it up the hill. So he was a... Uh, he was an extra in the movie Glory, um, and uh, yeah, he was Vine before there was Vines, and uh, I was trying to find my Glory DVD to, to, to show you the momentous moment in my family's history, uh, but I could not find it. So if you have Glory, huh? Where are they standing at? Here? Yeah, they're kind of like, land, like they're flying, I don't know. Huh? Now, notice this transition from former slave to Union soldier to purple veteran. And like I said, 10% uh, of the Union soldiers were African Americans. Uh, over 180,000 African American soldiers fought in the Civil War. Random fun fact number two, it would not be until after World War II, so we're talking 1946, 1947, when the U.S. military would be desegregated. So if you want to think about how crazy that is, World War I, U.S. soldiers were segregated based upon race. World War II, U.S. soldiers were segregated based upon race. Spanish-American War, same thing. So this is one of the realities of this. Now, back to the war, because we've got to end this today. My goal is to end the Civil War today. For those of you that thought, like, oh, after Antietam, we won, right? Because it was the turning point. So that means everything's good. We're, we're at home, smooth sailing. We're, like, you know, getting ready to, you know, give them a hug and say, hey, welcome back, brother. No. 
In fact, one thing you need to realize is the Eastern Theater, which is basically the eastern part of the war, things were going really bad for the Union even after Antietam. The general was this guy, and I only tell you his name because there's fun fact number three about to hit you with, General Ambrose E. Burnside. He's going to have problems. For example, the Union's going to lose a battle right here at Fredericksburg. Oh. The Union's going to surrender to the Confederacy in 1862. In fact, the Union's going to lose another battle at Chancellorsville. But before that, if you ever want to impress your friends, if you ever want to tell them random information that they never wanted to know nor cared to know, tell them. True story. Fun fact number three. Sideburns. That term to describe facial hair running along the side of your face, typically confined to men, but sometimes women too. Sideburns are actually named uh, in honor of this man, whose name was Burnside. I don't know how the switch happened, but as you can tell, he was a proud wearer of pretty awesome sideburns himself. Extra credit, 10 points. If any of you were able to grow this facial feature <laughs> and rock it until the AP exam, you will be the proud recipient of 10 extra credit points. So it's out there if you want it, okay? Now, victory for the Confederacy, Victory for the Confederacy at Chancellorsville, another battle. Once again, there's so many battles. Just know that the Union was not, the war was not over. So they got two victories, the Confederacy. And the reason why I tell you about these two victories, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, both of them are Union defeats. And it's the reason why Robert E. Lee is going to be looking to do what a lot of people know uh, about just because of the speech that happened there, he's going to go to Gettysburg. Now, before we go to Gettysburg, we have to have a moment of silence. Because, you know, sometimes, children, win. Sometimes when you win, you really lose. Right? 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 Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, sometimes yes. you win, yes. you really lose. And, and, and the reason, this is a life lesson here, but the reason why I mention this is at Chancellorsville, the Confederacy wins the battle, but they lose something really important to them. Stonewall Jackson was shot by his own man in a case of friendly fire during the Battle of Chancellorsville. His leadership was hugely important to the Confederacy and his death is a huge blow to the Confederate cause. Interestingly enough, friendly fire is a stupid term because it means you're shot by your own person, but it really should be called dumbass fire because dude, watch where you're shooting. But in reality, war is messy, especially war during 1863. But Stonewall Jackson is killed, and that is going to take away an important leader for the Confederate cause. Now, here's what happens. They're feeling good. They're feeling really good. When I say they, I mean the Confederacy. They're thinking, okay, we beat them at Fredericksburg. We beat them at Chancellorsville. Lee, Robert decides that he's going to go up to Gettysburg. Where's Gettysburg? What state? Take a look. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Which side is that on? It's the Union. Up until this point, the Confederacy has never really attacked the North. Remember, they don't have to. To win, they just don't have to lose. So Lee decides he's going to take the Confederate Army up into the Union and he's going to go there for a couple different reasons. He's looking for supplies, but he has other reasons why. Lee's going 
going north. Um, as I said, he's going there. He needs supplies, so what better way to uh, get supplies than to get them by taking them from the Union? He's also going north because he wants to scare Lincoln and the politicians of the north. Because he is thinking, if I can beat the North in the Northern Territory, in a Northern state, such as Pennsylvania, that that would scare them. That would cause them to say, hey, the South's going to win this war. We better negotiate. In fact, Jefferson Davis was so confident that the Confederacy was going to win, they sent a peace delegation to Washington, D.C. That's some arrogance right there. He also is hoping that if he wins, that pro-peace Democrats, those people that were in the North who really kind of wanted to negotiate it, settlement, that they would be willing to negotiate and that they would be able to uh, solve the war or to end the war quicker. And that last piece, he's still hoping that if he can show the Confederacy is viable, that it could win, that maybe England or France or some European country would come help them out. So he goes to Gettysburg with his soldiers to battle the North on northern soil. The battle takes place over three days in 1863. Um, the battle has been written about in tons of books. There's been movies made. July 1st, all sorts of stuff happens. You look at the map, they're going through ridges, and they're going over hills, and they're picket charge and all that stuff. You're going north. So we don't need to get into that, but Robert E. Lee is going there. And to show you the numbers, it's pretty crazy. Thousands and thousands of people. Robert E. Lee's strength when he goes up north is 50,000 people. Problem is, the Union Army has 75,000. So I know some of you are in calculus, so you will realize very quickly that the Union has an advantage in the numbers. See that? See that? If you're not in calculus, so, so 75,000 is more than 50,000. Write that down. So good. The battle takes place. There's the killed. There's the wounded. Um, a lot of people are injured. Total losses when you actually look at it. Huge numbers of people lost. Uh, through either being wounded, killed, or captured, Robert E. Lee is defeated at Gettysburg. Robert E. Lee is forced to retreat at Gettysburg. The Union wins. Robert E. Lee goes back down to Virginia. goes back down, one third of his army has been defeated, he lost 17 of his generals, his supplies are not increased, they actually are decreased, he stopped, it's a major victory for the Union Army, and as a result, a big loss for the Confederacy. Um, of course, Gettysburg is most kind of known for a couple months later, I think it's in November, Lincoln goes back to Gettysburg to dedicate the cemetery for the people who have lost their lives there. The speech is one of the best speeches ever in American history. It lasts two minutes. Short, powerful, takes America back to why it exists, our founding principles, challenges the American people to talk about this new birth of freedom. I'll play it for you in just a moment. Uh, at the time, Gettysburg Address Lincoln's speech was not something that was well known. People didn't really think of it as a big deal until later on. But at the time, he's just kind of dedicating the cemetery. But we got to go back west. So you have all these battles going on in the east. In the west, this guy's the Union general. Ulysses S. Grant. Anyone know anything about this guy? Anything at all? He'll become president. Anybody else? He won a battle at Alleghenies. He won a what? He won a battle at Alleghenies. It was his first success 
which allows the demons to like get a pass to invade Georgia. Okay. Yeah, he got. To, he was. A, he's a victorious general and was winning some battles. He's a, he's a drinker. Yeah! That's the important thing. <laughs> he was quite the guy who enjoyed the beverages with the alcohol in them. Now, the reason why I bring this up, not because it's like super duper important to American history, but it's kind of funny because Lincoln was hearing from other people that Grant is kind of a drunk. And that they should not put a lot of faith in Grant because he drinks a lot. And Lincoln replied when told about Grant's drinking tendencies. Well, tell me what he drinks and I'll buy the same thing for all my other generals because Grant's winning battles. Grant, I drink a load. Yeah. The exact quote was, give me the brand and I'll send a barrel to my other generals. Grant may have been questionable in terms of his moral character, but he was a really good general when it came to getting wins. Two wins you should know about because when I talk about the war out in the West, we're talking about in Tennessee, Mississippi. There's some battles at Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson. Just know about them. Don't need to even be an expert on them. Just know that the Union Army wins and that leads to kind of this approach called unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender basically meant, you'll never guess, what could it be? What does unconditional surrender mean? Let me give you some options here. Option A, when you surrender, you get to put conditions on it. We'll surrender if A, you do this, you, you hug my mom, you, I still get to keep my property, or would it be B, when you surrender, you accept whatever terms are given to you? Who's in favor of A? Who's in favor of B? Who has no idea what I'm saying right now because it's Monday and you're still in a turkey-induced coma because you're gluttonous and you're going to get diabetes and because you ate 4,500 calories and the average American is supposed to eat only 2,000 calories? I mean, you'll have a pool with 35 people in it. <laughs> Who bought me something on Black Friday? <laughs> oh, never mind. Who's learning from the next door neighbor life class? Like, <laughs> unconditional surrender basically means you surrender without any conditions. And so that was the approach taken in this. They win these battles. Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson. You see them over there on the map near Tennessee, the border of Kentucky. Now, the reason why I tell you about that, the other significant battle that happens one day after Gettysburg, Ulysses S. Grant and the Union Army attack this area right here, Vicksburg. Vicksburg is right there along the Mississippi River in Mississippi. Uh, Vicksburg is extremely important because Vicksburg is along the river, which means if the Confederacy holds that fort at Vicksburg, they are able to control access to the river, which means the Union Navy can't do what it needs to do to help the war effort. Well, Grant and the Union Army lay siege on Vicksburg. They're basically attacking it, attacking it. The fort refuses to surrender. Things were so bad inside the fort that the Confederate soldiers in there were reduced to eating rats to survive. But eventually, on July 4th, at Vicksburg, victory. This is the kind of course of the war, because one of the things you need to realize is that the battles take place. The soldiers start t conquering, and so this is Union territory. They slowly start conquering, and then you have Vicksburg. They're bombing it in June, and in July. Real American heroes. Real American heroes. Vicksburg falls. The South surrenders on July 4th, 1863. These victories, the victory at Vicksburg and the victory at Gettysburg, are referred to as the twin victories. 
and they are very important victories. One in the West, Vicksburg, one on the East, Gettysburg. They're both Union victories that show that the Union cause is starting to become victorious. The war is not over yet, but once again, significant battles fought, won, uh, and the Confederacy is having a much more difficult time continuing the fight. So Grant gets a reputation. Like Chesapeake over there said, he will become President of the United States later on. So we'll see him again. There's the war. You can see it as the years go on. 1861, the yellowish color. 62, the Union Army is starting to kind of conquer Southern territory. 63, you got the green. There you got Vicksburg by July. 64, look at what's happening here. There's going to be a guy who's going to run through Georgia. Georgia. Oh, got you slipping almost. Good job. Good recovery. And of course, by 1865, the whole thing is destroyed, which leads me to the next part, total war. By 1863, 1864, the Union decides the Southern way of life is going to end, right? No more slavery, and they're going to destroy everything they come into contact with. And this guy... So Sherman is the guy when it comes to total war tactics. He is a Union general. He's going to lead a massive invasion through the state of Georgia. Georgia. And that invasion is going to lead to the capture of the city of Atlanta. And total war tactics basically means he's going to go in there. Doesn't he look crazy? Look at the eyes. Imagine him standing over you as you sleep staring at you. Imagine him eating a puppy, just chewing on it. Delicious. Delicious. Tasty. Get the golden retrievers. Boy, meat is very tender. Total War Tactics. Here's the goal. You're going to march through the south, and there's Sherman's little route going up into Atlanta, September 1864. Gets to Savannah just by Christmas. In fact, he kind of says to Lincoln, I'm going to deliver you Savannah for Christmas. As a present, the goal is physical destruction of the land. So when you come to a farm, you burn the crops. When you come to a railroad uh, depot, you destroy it. Yes? Did they sell any of the lands? Did they sell it? No, salt. they gave it away. Salt. Salt. Yeah. Oh, to make them infertile or yeah. to make them less so? I believe it was used. I'm not 100% sure. They, they, they did light things on fire. I don't know if they used salt, though. Yeah. So what if they had to fix it after when they won the war? Like, all the destruction they caused? Think about your perspective when you've been fighting three, three and a half years of horrible fighting. One, you don't know when the war is going to end. So you're not worried about what you're going to do after the war is over. And your goal is to shorten the war so this is the way you do it. Because you destroy the morale of Southerners. You make them feel like there is no hope at all. And so, yes, when the war is over, you're going to have to deal with it as a nation, but it's not really your priority at that point. What do they do? Well, the Union Army runs through Georgia, Georgia, burning down Atlanta, burning down Savannah, destroying everything they come across. Uh, this is one of the few pictures that kind of shows it, but just to kind of give you an idea, see these big old, you know, concrete pillars? That used to be a railroad station. Not there anymore. There's the railroad tracks having been destroyed. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of document, you know, images of this. But there he is going through, delivers Savannah by Christmas. Eventually, they're going to head up, heading towards Richmond. And here's an artist's depiction of that. You can see all sorts of craziness going on. Railroad being destroyed. Houses burning. The Union soldiers occupying the town. There you go. Now, we're going to almost end this thing. I'm going to end the Civil War, and my goal is in the next two to three minutes. So after the attack, 
got these battles, you got the map, kind of take a look, quick look on the map because it kind of gets, you know, crazy here. We have, you know, Vicksburg over here. We have those Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson. We have Gettysburg. We have, you know, William Tecumseh Sherman going through this way. You get these other battles. Uh, the war slowly is coming to an end. Grant has now been named the general of the Eastern Front. Uh, it's total war. That's the strategy. You have a battle at the Wilderness Campaign, which is up in here, up in Virginia, in May of 1864. Horrible, horrible fighting. Guys are literally pinning their name and address to their uniform so that when they go into battle, they pretty much think they're going to die, and they put their name and their address so that their loved ones can know what happened to them. It's like brutal fighting. There's another battle. Eventually, the Union wins at the Wilderness Campaign. You have another battle at Cold Harbor in June of 1864. Once again, horrible, horrible fighting. Um, a lot of outrage. Uh, Grant's tactics were unpopular because basically it was full-scale war. One of the reasons why the Union is able to win is, yes, lots of people are dying, but they got more people to keep sending to the battlefield. Grant even gets the nickname Grant the Butcher by people who don't like his tactics. So you have all this fighting taking places, Cold Harbor, famous image from Cold Harbor, of the battlefield the weeks after collecting the dead, uh, the destruction of the war. In the middle of all this, there's an election. We don't think about the political side of war, but there is an election. Lincoln runs for re-election in 1864. Um, Lincoln has some problems, though. He's got radical Republicans who are criticism, criti critical of some of his things. He's got peace Democrats. He's got war Democrats. In 1864, the war was still going on. A lot of people are questioning, how long is this thing going to last? He picks a guy, and this will be important because, like you all know, Lincoln's going to die. He picks this guy, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee. Andrew Johnson was from a Confederate state. When Confederates, when Tennessee left the Union, Andrew Johnson was the only Southern senator who did not leave with his state. So he was a pro-Union guy, but he was a Southerner. He also was a Democrat. Lincoln picks Andrew Johnson as a way to appeal to Democrats, Southerners, and those individuals who may not have loved him for being Republican and a Northerner. Now, no one ever thought that Andrew Johnson would become president. Well, he will. Interestingly, Lincoln is running against McClellan. George McClellan is running as the Democratic candidate for president. Remember the old general from the Army of the Potomac. Kind of give you some perspective of the kind of things that were brought up during this election. This is a Democratic campaign poster. Elect Lincoln and the black Republican ticket. You will bring on <gasps> Negro equality, more debt, harder times, and another draft. Universal anarchy and ultimate ruin. If you elect McClellan, you will defeat Negro equality and you will preserve the Union. The election takes place and Lincoln wins. If you look at this map, it looks like Lincoln just kicked the crap out of McClellan. But this is the electoral vote. Remember what it means. That means the blue, the electoral votes go to Lincoln. He gets 91% of the electoral vote. If you look at the red, McClellan does not too bad in the popular vote. But McClellan was trying to portray himself as the one who was going to bring the country back together. Here you see him kind of, kind of strong-arming Jefferson Davis and Lincoln. The reality is, he doesn't win. Part of the reason why he doesn't win, this will be on the test, is because the Union started winning battles again. And when morale is up, when people are feeling like things are going good, there's a better chance that the guy who's in charge will stay in charge. And a lot of Union soldiers were allowed to vote uh, by leaving their post to go cast their vote. One other thing, does anyone notice anything on this map? This is actually the map that is more accurate 
uh, because it shows kind of where McClellan did well, where Lincoln did well. Hint, hint, hint. Look at the political party. What's Lincoln's political party on there? Union. Union. What party is he supposed to belong to? Yeah. Kind of random fun fact number five or four. I don't know which one we're on. Lincoln in 1864 does not run as a Republican. The Republican Party doesn't exist in 1864 presidential election. He calls his ticket, him and Andrew Johnson, the Union Party. And part of that was to appeal to a wide range of individuals and to get votes from not just Republican areas, but others based upon this idea that he was the party of the Union. So he's still a Republican, but in 1864, he doesn't label himself that. Now here's a wild thing. The war is going to end in like 20 seconds. So you have all these battles. Remember the Wilderness Campaign, Cold Harbor. Eventually, Robert E. Lee is captured and surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse in April, April 9, 1865. There's some smaller battles that happen in the days and the weeks and the months later, but the final kind of surrender of Robert E. Lee, April 9, 1865. The wild thing about it, five days later, five days after a war which has been fought for over four years, Five days after it ends, Lincoln, while at the theater in Washington, D.C., while sitting there enjoying a show with his wife by his side inside Ford Theater, he is shot in the head by a pro-Southern actor named John Wilkes Booth. death will shock the nation and throw all sorts of issues into question um, and there is his dead body for you weirdos out there Lincoln lying in state waiting for his burial and before I show you the video that I want to show you Lincoln is the most written about person in history except for some guy named Jesus. I don't know who he is. Lincoln, there are over 15,000 books written about him. This is in one of the museums right across the street from Ford Theater, where you can go inside and see the, the, the box where he was sitting with his wife when he was killed. You can actually go across the street and see the bed, the bed that he died on with the stained sheets from the blood. But this is inside the museum. It's about six, seven floors of books, all of them about Lincoln. You have some free time over the winter break. You can kind of take a look at some of them. And before we see the video, are there any questions?